then. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Anna. I'm the lead environmental educator at the Vermont Institute of Natural Science, and we're super excited to have you join us for this live Raptor Encounter stream today. Uh, if you've been following along with our themed programs this week, this week's theme was science in the community, and we've actually had a lot of different experts in their fields uh, doing presentations about their work in conservation and ecosystem ecology and things like that. And so those are all uh, available for you to access on our YouTube channel or on Facebook. So I encourage you to go back and take a look at those to learn more about the science that's going around uh, on around us right now. So uh, I wanted to mention that. I also wanted to mention that after this live stream at 3 p.m. today will be another live stream featuring Sarah telling some campfire stories. So please be sure to tune in for that as well. Now, if you're familiar with the Vermont Institute of Natural Science and what we do, our mission is to inspire people to care about the natural world in several different ways. One is through education, um, which normally when our nature center is open to the public, which unfortunately we are not quite yet open to the public again, uh, we would do on site here. But for now, we're really excited to engage you with uh, all of these online programs that we've been putting out. So uh, please make sure to check those out. Um, another part of our mission is our avian wildlife rehabilitation. So we have a bird hospital right here on site that sees injured and orphaned wild birds for care. And we currently have quite the crop of baby birds in that people have been bringing us. So even though our nature center is closed to the public, the Center for Wild Bird Rehabilitation is open. So if you have a concern about an injured or a baby bird uh, in your neighborhood, please do give us a call and we'll be able to help you out with that. And the last part of our mission is our research, and we try to get people motivated to get involved in the research in their own community through citizen science projects like Nestwatch. So that's another great tie-in to all of our baby birds that are out and about this season. So keep your eyes peeled for that robin's nest or that Phoebe's nest under the eaves of your house, uh, and check out some of the resources on uh, Vin's website under citizen science that uh, might help you monitor those nests for biologists. So today with our raptor encounter, we're going to have a throwback to early March when we used to do uh, large live raptor uh, programs right here on site at the Nature Center. And I've got three of my uh, uh, co-workers, my feathered co-workers here to meet you today. So we'll talk a little bit about each of them and uh, what their cousins out in the wild are up to. So I'll be right back with our very first ambassador bird. Oh, guys. And also, I forgot to mention before, but Feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, please type them in the comments or in the chat, uh, and I will be sure to answer your questions uh, if you have them. But our first guest today is Troy. This is Troy right here, and he's a barred owl, which uh, many of you, if you're from the Northeast or really anywhere on the East Coast of the United States are probably familiar with barred owls like Troy, B-A-R-R-E-D, barred, named for the vertical stripes that he has uh, on his chest that appear to be like chocolate bars, I like to say. Barred owls are super common in our area, though, because we have the ideal habitat for them. They really like deep, dark, wet forests as hunting grounds and nesting grounds. And boy, have we seen a lot of nesting barred owls through our uh, wildlife clinic this year. They are cavity nesters, which means that they look for a big dead tree that has a crack or a hole in it that they can lay their eggs right there on the bottom of that cavity in the bottom of that hole in the tree. And they can raise up to five young at a time, which seems kind of insane to us. Having, having to take care of uh, one or two baby barred owls at a time is quite the handful. And so these uh, barred owl parents are really, really busy at this time of year. 
You might hear them in your woods, not necessarily see them because as you might notice, Troy is pretty well camouflaged, not with this wall behind me, but with the trees in our forests. If he was sitting on a branch up against uh, the back of a maple tree or an oak tree, those gray and brown and creamy white bars would help him blend right into the tree. So they've got pretty good camouflage. Now, the way that you might notice the barred owls in your woods is if you hear their call. And that's a pretty distinctive call. They make a sound that sounds like, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? If you're familiar with that. It's a short staccato barking sound. That's kind of a I've had to learn how to do that because Troy doesn't. He's, he's the strong silent type, as we say. Um, and the reason that they might be calling back and forth has to do with pair bonding. Earlier in the spring and in the late winter, two barred owls will come back together after having spent the winter apart at a common nest site. The male and female generally reuse the same nest site year after year after year, so long as it ends up being successful for them and they're young. But having spent the winter apart, they need to find each other again in the spring. And one way they do that is by literally calling out, saying essentially, hey, are you here? Are, are you my mate? or are you somebody different? And they might get into a territorial dispute. They might um, fight off another barred owl that's intruding upon their area where their nest cavity is, or they might just happily call back and forth, um, uh, excited to see each other again and get going with a new family. Speaking of nesting birds, we've got some robins outside the window right here that Troy is very, very interested in at the moment. You get, you get fed later, buddy, right after this, it's dinner time. So Troy actually came to us um, quite a while ago. He came to live uh, with us at Vins in 2013. So we know that he is at least seven years old. And the reason why he was brought to us was because, oh, nope, not going for the robins. The reason why Troy was brought to us was because he had suffered an injury out in the wild. And unfortunately, this is a kind of common thing for barred owls, especially in the wintertime when food is kind of scarce, they have developed a strategy of hunting alongside of roads, which might not seem that great, not smart, but if you think about a roadside, a lot of stuff piles up there. People, unfortunately, sometimes they throw things out of their car window. Maybe it's an apple core and they're thinking, oh, you know, that's gonna biodegrade, that's, that's fine. Uh, no, no reason not to throw that out the window. But before that apple core dissolves into the soil, probably something will find it, like a bunch of beetles. And then those beetles will attract a mouse who wants to eat those beetles. And that mouse might attract a barred owl who would like to eat the mouse. And then barred owls end up preferentially hanging out by the side of the road looking for good things to eat because they found good things there before. And it seems like a really good hunting ground for them until one of them gets hit by a car, which can happen because these guys are very well adapted for nighttime hunting. They've got very large eyes, as you notice on Troy, and those large eyes work just like big windows do. The bigger the window you have, the more light comes into the eye. And so he gathers a lot of light with his giant eyes. And in the nighttime, when there's not so much light available, maybe just the moon or the stars, that helps him see. But when a car's coming down the road with its headlights on, that can absolutely overwhelm his system and it might momentarily blind or stun an owl. Troy was unfortunately one such owl who was blinded in the headlights of a car and was unfortunately hit by that car. He was hit in the head apparently because his main injury is that he can't see out of his left eye. So the one that's pointing at the computer screen right now, he's completely blind in, unfortunately. And so that puts him at a pretty severe disadvantage compared to uh, other barred owls, other wild barred owls that are fully sighted that they uh, he would have to compete with. So Troy lives here with us, um, has for the last seven years as an education ambassador. Um, it's been a while since he's done a program, but I was super excited to show him off to you. Given that, oh, He's gotten a little bit nervous about the room and about all the things going on outside. I'm gonna sneak him back into his crate and get out our very next ambassador bird. But please, if you do have any questions, type them in the chat uh, and I will be able to answer them. Be right back. Thank you. 
All right, here we are. This here is Bloomfield. And Bloomfield is a very different kind of bird of prey, as you might notice, but one that might be slightly more familiar to you than the barred owl. This bird is, I'll turn her around so you can see her beautiful red tail. Yes, this is a red-tailed hawk. Now, red-tailed hawks are found not just on the East Coast like the barred owl, but across the United States into southern Canada and all the way down through Mexico as well. And they pretty much are habitat generalists. So that means that they would live anywhere that had just, you know, the adequate food supply and the right place to nest for them. Oh, we're going to poop. That was a big one. My goodness. It's nice that they give me a little bit of warning first. The tail goes up. So you could see red-tailed hawks in open uh, spaces like grasslands in the Midwest. You could see them here on sort of forest edge habitat, a forest near a wetland or a forest near a meadow, um, and also urban habitats as well. There's been uh, red-tailed hawks nesting in Central Park in Manhattan for over 30 years now. So they're quite adaptable to these different scenarios, so long as there's enough food for them, of course. Red-tailed hawks are also pretty opportunistic when it comes to food. They don't just eat mice, uh, as you might imagine. Mice are pretty tasty for her, sure, but she could also eat squirrels. She could eat a young groundhog or a young cottontail rabbit. In cities, they eat rats, as well as New York City pigeons, for sure. Pigeons are actually pretty acrobatic outside of the french fries and milkshakes diet of New York City. Um, but in, in those urban places, pigeons provide a huge amount of the diet of red-tailed hawk. So between those things, those species of prey animals that I just listed for the red-tailed hawk, they can tend to overpopulate near humans and become pests for us. They spread disease, they damage property. It's not great to have huge populations of rats anywhere, but red-tailed hawks take care of that for us. So it's important to have them around. The places where I've seen the most red-tailed hawks is actually also along the side of the road. When you're driving down the highway here in Vermont, driving down 91, you can almost count the miles by how many red-tailed hawks you see. They seem to be mile markers sitting there with their nice creamy red, white belly with the dark belly band going across the bottom and the dark head just plopped on a branch out in the open watching the grassy median for the squirrels that are coming in and out of the woods to find uh, nuts or seeds or acorns and the like. So they're quite uh, opportunistic in that way and they unfortunately are also at risk of getting hit by cars. But there's other things that uh, are can trouble a red-tailed hawk as well because they're so much uh, more uh, willing to live close to humans. They can also suffer collisions with windows, collisions with wind turbines. And in the case of Bloomfield here, our red-tailed hawk, she actually suffered a collision with a power line. Uh, when she was very young, back when she came into our rehabilitation clinic, she did not yet have her red tail. She still had a stripy brown and whitish tail that the juvenile red-tailed hawks, birds in their first or second summer, have a stripy tail. So we knew that she was pretty young. And I imagine that she was trying to chase a prey item that had flown between the power lines. And she did not yet know that her wingspan is over four feet long and she would not have fit between those power lines. And she unfortunately broke her left humerus. That's her upper arm bone. So she can no longer fly long distances. She is capable of some degree of flight. And so we offer her that opportunity here at Vince. She's trained to fly between two uh, trainers, two handlers during some of our bird programs. And even though we haven't been doing these programs, we're still getting Bloomfield out and about for flights. Uh, in fact, she just did so uh, about an hour and a half ago. Uh, my colleague and I were flying her back and forth between gloves, uh, standing in the field. And uh, we're very lucky that she can do flights that are more than six feet, so we can keep our social distancing. So red-tailed hawks are uh, a pretty common phenomenon everywhere across the United States. That's why they're a really good bird to get to know in your local neighborhood. Whenever you see a bird soaring overhead, 
it's uh, a really good idea to take a look at certain field marks, but also the shape and the behavior of the bird, because a lot of the time this soaring bird might have the sun at its back and you might just be seeing a kind of black silhouette like our broad winged hawk uh, logo there. So even though the red tail is a key identifier of red tail hawk, the black belly band, if you can't see the red tail, other things will tell you whether or not you're looking at a red tailed hawk uh, based on its behavior. The red tailed hawks tend to soar in thermals. Thermals are rising columns of hot air that come off the land during the day. As the sun warms the land, it warms different parts of the land differently. It would, for example, warm a forest differently than it warms a meadow, differently than a parking lot. And so a kind of spiraling column of hot air can form over parts of the land. And that spiraling column rises up into the upper atmosphere. And a lot of birds know about this. And they can take advantage of this elevator of air to get them really high in the sky without having to flap, without having to expend a lot of energy to use their muscles to get that high into the sky. So anytime you see a bird circling with its wings out, not flapping, that is most definitely a bird that's taking advantage of a thermal, taking advantage of that soaring. Now, that's not necessarily diagnostic of a red-tailed hawk. There are several hawk species that thermal soar. There are also vultures and eagles and ravens and crows that will take advantage of thermals. So identifying a hawk involves looking at the silhouette of the body and how they hold their wings. Soaring hawks tend to have sort of broad, long, flat wings with a relatively short fan-shaped tail. Our broadwing hawk logo here, he's got his tail all nicely fanned out right there, and that actually helps them gather more air underneath them. Essentially, they're trying to form a big panel of their body and gather all the air so that it can carry them into the sky, almost like a hot air balloon would. They tend also, all of the hawks, to be fairly straight line flyers. And what I mean by that is that their silhouette looking head on, their two wings are straight out parallel to the ground in one long line. A key identifying feature of a vulture by contrast to a hawk is that they hold their wings up in what's called a dihedral, a little bit past that parallel, a sort of kind of a V shape. And uh, turkey vultures in particular also wobble a little bit in the air while they soar using this V shape to help generate some more lift in unpredictable wind situations. So very, very versatile, very adaptable and easily identifiable birds that are probably in your neighborhood all the time. Unless you live in very, very, very far Northern parts of Canada, you probably have red tail hawks in your neighborhood even in the winter time. This is a partial migrant species. So some of the birds migrate south for the winter, but some of our red-tailed hawks stay with us all winter long. And they're able to hunt those squirrels that poke their noses out of their burrows a little bit too early in the spring, uh, as well as a lot of birds. And uh, generally hold a larger territory than they would necessarily in the spring. Awesome. Bloomfield's getting a little ants in her pants too, but I see I have a question. Do you have plans to reacquaint the birds to people when you reopen? Kelly, very good question. We have plans to reacquaint the birds to people before we reopen. We like to sort of cut it off at the pass, as it, as it were. Um, all of our birds, for the most part, um, they are have not lost their... Uh, comfort with people so much. We do, myself and the other educators, the staff that come in and work with our birds every day, we are making sure that they see us at the very least every day, uh, if not huge crowds of people. Uh, but we hope to uh, introduce them to uh, quote unquote strangers again uh, in small doses before we reopen. So for example, I actually did this today with one of our newer education birds who this, she's not familiar with large crowds of people at all. This won't be reacquainting her, it's acquainting her. Um, but I had two staff who happened to be on site uh, who were outside taking pictures. I had them uh, come over to me and stand very still. And then I brought this bird toward them uh, and I rewarded her with little tidbits of her diet uh, whenever she was calm standing near them. Uh, and we got to a certain point where she was starting to look a little bit nervous. So I just took a step back and we went home. Um, but that's kind of the process of, of what it will be to reacquaint our birds. Small groups at first uh, and then, then owl festival. 
<laughs> 2,000 people come to visit us at Owl Festival. I'm not sure if um, uh, that's going to be as big as it was last year, but very well may be. Awesome. Any other questions, please just uh, type them up in the chat and we'll be able to get to them. And meanwhile, I'm going to sneak Bloomfield back in her crate because we have one more bird to meet. And he's a very special one. So I'll be right back. All right, I brought you the little guy. Okay, so, so far in our raptor encounter, we have met two raptors, uh, an owl and a hawk. And this last guy I've got to introduce to you today is neither of those. Um, you can see he's quite a bit smaller than the other two, but that's not necessarily diagnostic of what he is. He is an American kestrel, which is a kind of falcon. Now, the falcons and the hawks are very, very different birds. They may seem quite alike in that they both are uh, birds of prey. They're birds that hunt other animals, especially vertebrate animals, mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, uh, as well as fish. But the falcons kind of came to this point from a very different place on the bird family tree. And the closest relative of the falcon is, in fact, the parrot. You might kind of get that looking a little bit at Ferrisburg, our American kestrel here, he's quite a bit more colorful than either the hawk or the owl that we met. He's got a kind of straighter uh, up and down posture. He's got a longer set of wings and a longer tail for sure. And of course he does have that hooked beak, which is parrot-like, but it's also bird of prey-like. That's uh, something that they both share. So Ferrisburg is, I said, he's a kind of a special guy because uh, I like especially talking about him at this time of year. Ferrisburg came to us as a very young bird. It was just a hatchier bird. He had all his feathers out already. But the way that he came into human care was that somebody was walking down the street uh, of Ferrisburg, Vermont, just minding their own business, when this little bird flew up to them and landed on their shoulder and started screaming into their ear. Now, this person knew that this is not normal behavior for a wild bird. And it, you should all know that that's not normal behavior for a wild bird either. Most wild birds don't want anything to do with people, but this guy seemed to want something very much. The person was able to take Ferrisburg to a rehabilitator who determined that although he was perfectly healthy, there was nothing physically wrong with Ferrisburg, he was imprinted on humans, which means that he believes he is a little baby human being. And that would have happened because a human raised him from a baby. Imprinting is a process of an animal discovering what they are and therefore how they're supposed to behave in the wild. Normally, a little American kestrel would look up into the faces of its American kestrel parents and say, OK, yeah, uh, I'm an American kestrel. I'm going to do what you do. I'm going to look for a girlfriend that looks kind of like you guys when I'm ready to start a family. But since Ferrisburg was raised by humans in a family, in a home, he unfortunately doesn't know how to do kestrel things. He only knows how to do human things and, and poorly because, you know, he doesn't have fingers or hands. So he looks to people to feed him. He looks to people when he's kind of excited that it's springtime and would like to maybe start, start laying some eggs with, with a lady. Uh, so he's very ill-equipped to live in the wild because of this and for no other reason. He would otherwise be a healthy, free-living American kestrel um, doing some great uh, services for our ecosystem. But because some people tried to raise him, unfortunately, he can't do that. 
Now, American Kestrels provide great, great ecosystem services, meaning they the things that they do, the behaviors that they take normally in the wild benefit humans uh, in an easily measurable way. You mostly see American kestrels in places like open meadows, fields, and farmlands. You probably have seen one of these birds uh, and not known it if you see a little bird sitting all alone on a power line, uh, sitting over a meadow, maybe the tail is bobbing in and out, maybe the head is bobbing up and down occasionally. Watch Ferrisburg for those behaviors while I'm talking about him. And there goes the head bob, right? Uh, and then maybe it flew down and grabbed something and flew back up to its power line, was holding a grasshopper or a field mouse, or a sparrow in its talons. These birds hunt the very things that farmers consider pests and try and put pesticides out to get rid of, or traps out to get rid of, or um, breed uh, amazing plants that are resistant to these pests. So much money goes into um, uh, reducing the number of grasshoppers or mice that are eating farmers' crops when American kestrels also do that for us and they do it completely for free. So I really appreciate knowing that there are wild American kestrels out and about eating all those grasshoppers so I don't have to worry about losing all of my uh, pea plants and spinach uh, in the spring. So they provide great services for us and while I wish that Ferrisburg was able to be out in the wild, uh, I hope that his story can help convey how important it is to let wildlife be wild so that they can do these things that help us very much. And so I wanted to put in a plug for our Center for Wild Bird Rehabilitation at the end of this, because we are open and we are accepting bird patients. And right now we're accepting a lot of baby birds. Baby birds like Ferrisburg probably was at one point. Now, most baby birds really need to be taken care of by their own parents. That makes sense, right? They evolved to be taken care of by their own species. And so when at all possible, we actually try and re-nest baby birds that we find. You might have heard that it's uh, not okay to touch a baby bird in the wild because the parents will then smell the human on it and reject the baby. That's not true at all. Get that out of your mind. Uh, fortunately, birds don't have a great sense of smell right now. Um, Ferrisburg is probably smelling my body odor, but he doesn't care because he doesn't have a great sense of smell. So <laughs> these birds will not smell the human on their baby. All they'll notice is, ah, my baby's back. It's hungry. I'm going to feed it. This is what I know how to do. So if you find a baby bird and you know where the nest is, and you also know that the parents are in the area, just plop that baby right back in its nest. If you find a baby bird and you don't know where the nest is, or you know that the nest got destroyed, but the parents are in the area, you can actually construct a little fake nest for them. Um, my suggestion would be uh, a little uh, Tupperware container with a few holes poked in the bottom for drainage that's lined with uh, leaves and pine needles, something soft like that. Just put the babies in that. And if you can wire that to a bush, uh, somehow make it secure near where the old nest was, the parents will continue to take care of those babies in the new nest. Now, if the parents are not in the area or you know that the parents are gone, that's a situation where you might want to call us or a wildlife rehabilitator near you because in that situation, the babies will need to be cared for by people. If there's, their parents aren't around, then uh, it falls to us to do so. And our staff here are extremely skilled in determining exactly what that baby needs, what its diet needs to be uh, for in order for, to grow up healthy, uh, housing it with other members of its species. For example, a, a, a lone little baby blue jay is at risk of becoming imprinted, just like this American kestrel, if we didn't do things like wear masks, not talk while we feed the baby, uh, or house the baby blue jay with another baby blue jay, for example, so it can they can learn from each other. So uh, if you do have any questions at all about baby birds in your neighborhood, uh, send us an email or give us a call and we should be able to help out with that. Great. Ferrisburg's enjoying himself, really. This is, is a behavior called preening. He is dipping his beak uh, into his feathers, as you can see, uh, grabbing one or two of those feathers at a time and then sort of zipping his beak along the feather shaft to uh, close up the barbs to make it nice and neat and able to resist air. So if he's gonna go fly somewhere, uh, he's gotta have his feathers all nice and zipped and neat and tight. Yeah. 
he's quite quite enjoying himself. Not a care in the world when a bird is preening. They're not worried about anything. And that behavior was called a rouse. And that's sort of the end of the preening session. Got to shake everything back down uh, into alignment. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you for your question. Um, and if you do have any others, if you're thinking back on this program, you say, oh my gosh, I should have asked that, please uh, send us an email, info at vinsweb.org. Uh, link will be in the description, or you can find that on our website. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, as I mentioned, the Vins Nature Center is uh, still closed to the public. Oh, question. Great. Laura asks, how do we know the falcons are more closely related to parrots than to other birds of prey? Very good question, because we did not know that for many thousands of years. Uh, DNA evidence uh, revealed that connection. Um, for the most part, the, the group, um, taxonomic group, Falconiformes, as it's called, included all the birds of prey. Hawks, eagles, falcons, and owl, or not owls, actually, they've always been different. But hawks and eagles and falcons used to be until uh, the 80s, I want to say. Um, in the same order. But since DNA evidence uh, has cropped up and our ability to analyze the, uh, the base codes, the DNA in falcons and hawks and compare the two of them together, it's been shown that falcons are most closely related to parrots, whereas the eagles are most closely related to hawks. And hawks are most closely related to, you know, osprey and, and uh, vultures actually and the like. So uh, it turned out that by reading reading into the genetic code, uh, falcons turned out to be way, way, way far away from where we thought they were based on their morphology or based on their physical adaptations that we could see. Very good question. Awesome. There's lots of really neat papers about um, bird taxonomy if you're interested in those. So yeah, once again, uh, unfortunately, we are not yet open to the public. We are looking to open again uh, around June 15th, but don't quote me. Keep checking our website for that date uh, and welcoming people back in with uh, some new protocols to keep everybody safe, safe and healthy. But as I mentioned, the Center for Wild Bird Rehabilitation is still open. So uh, please give us a call if you're wondering about anything uh, wild bird related and uh, keep tuning in to all of our live streams. Oh, we've got all the comfort behaviors right there. That's a nice little wing stretch. Keep tuning into our live streams, keep tuning into our videos, and let us know uh, what more you would like us to do for you and to see. We're also uh, getting going with our spring appeal and uh, wanted to mention that we're entirely funded by donations, admissions, and memberships. Uh, so as a nonprofit organization, we would be extremely grateful if you considered a donation to our spring appeal so that we can keep doing all of this education work uh, and we really sincerely hope to see you again uh, uh, very, very soon. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>